Mike live here at the uh, Grand Theatre in Leeds. Thank God you didn't stick that up ten seconds earlier. It's BBC Radio Leeds. We're live at the theatre that's home to Spamalot, and it's always nice to see Marcus Briggs start getting me into trouble again. I didn't swear. I didn't swear. <laughs> I swore before we started the programme, and if the mic came up before I expected, I can only apologise to the fine listeners out there. You might get away with this on your mucky play, but you don't get away with it on Radio Leeds. <laughs> mucky play? How dare you? <laughs> Uh, this is sophisticated musical theatre, I'll have you know, with some proper filth in it. You play King Arthur and Hayley to Madden. I mean, you've got to be the focus of this interview. You're delicious and gorgeous and the Lady of the Lake. How are oh, you? Oh, what? thank you. <laughs> what a nice welcome. You've got everything, haven't you, really? Have I? Oh, yes. keep going. You're doing this for me. Keep going. We'll talk to you in a bit. And Todd Carty, of course. Everybody loves you. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm live and kicking. Thank you. You've skated in here today and uh, everybody seems pleased to see you. And if you don't mind me saying, I think he's got the hardest job in this play called Spam a Lot because you're the only one who actually seems to be doing any acting because you don't do much other than act, do you? Well, I, I, I don't know. Poor old Pat and Pat's uh, King Arthur's page and horse, and I don't say very much in it, but uh, I knock out a tune, as the actress <laughs> said to the bishop, and uh, that's about it. But we're having great fun doing it, and the audience we had last night seemed to like it, so hopefully the rest of uh, you know the good citizens of Leeds will enjoy it just as much. We all know you're a sex symbol, but you've mastered the art of looking gormless in this. Oh, that's quite easy, I can promise you that. Just ask my kids. I look very gormless when I wake up in the morning and I keep that look all day. And Marcus, what I love about you is the fact that you don't really want to be there. You appear like you've got this job because obviously there's a recession on, you've got to earn money some way. And you're not kind of sticking it up in a Broadway sense, so you're just kind of giving us the lines opposed to, to doing much with them. Well, now, you see, the thing is... No, you see, I would I would Broadway it up if I knew how. No, I mean, honestly, uh, without wanting to get too much into the technical craft of acting, uh, Arthur in this is... He's, he's fairly sensible compared to the rest of the cast. You know, he's found himself king in a kingdom where most people don't recognise him as king and don't seem to know what's going on anyway. You know, I mean, he chops the Black Knight's arms and legs off and the man still thinks he can bite him to death. You know, for some reason in his kingdom, there's some French people who fart in his general direction. And, you know, and just wherever he goes, people are weird and confusing. So Arthur is... He's, he is relatively straight in this, which took me a while to get used to, you know, but um, um, when I say straight, Tamadan, that's not... Shut up, honestly. Um, so, yeah, so I, I wouldn't Broadway it up even if I knew how, I don't think. I would like to chip in there because, in actual fact, he does know how to Broadway it up because you should see him in his dressing room 20 minutes before we go on stage where he turns MacArthur Park on and dances around <laughs> to Donna Summer for 20 minutes. And I have to admit, I do join in. Yeah. And we have a, a little mini party, don't we, before we go on. It's brilliant. It's awesome. All right, so Donna nice. Summer next. If they can get that ready for us, we'll play a track from Spam a lot and then we'll get some Donna Summer on. Which is your favourite? Yeah. Yes, MacArthur Park. Uh, MacArthur Park is amazing. Or enough of uh, enough is enough yeah. with um, uh, with Barbara Streisand, the wonderful Barbara. Her nails are like butter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the interesting thing about you've come from a, a world of comedy which is very lonely and downtrodden and unglamorous and it's you on stage by yourself and then you get to sit next to Hayley I mean it must be amazing for you to have someone to talk to <laughs> sit next to her I get to snog her twice in the show it was once and then we worked in another one uh, yeah no I mean honestly you know stand up I usually I go on I talk for an hour to 700 people and then I go and sit on my own for 20 minutes and then I talk for an hour to 700 people and then I drive home on my own listening to Radio 4 uh, so yeah this is this is lovely you know I've got people to hang out with and a lot of them are pretending to be my friends and it's all yeah it's really nice it's good fun and when you get to snog him the beard does it chafe do you know what? No, it's like really soft and fluffy. And he's got it to this length now where when we first started doing it, it was a little bit prickly. And now he, ma he puts moisturiser on it and all sorts for me. It's brilliant. Mm. It's really good. Are you on the turn, Marcus? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, the thing is... Um, Hayley was all right with the chafing, but Patsy wasn't. Todd, Todd said I had to, I had to shave it a bit. Todd, we're going to play um, "I'm Not Dead Yet," which is one of the funniest tracks that comes on in the beginning, and that's when we really realise that this ain't Shakespeare. This is a comedy. Um, lead us into this and, and what this is all about. Well, it goes back to the Holy Grail film, doesn't it? When uh, uh, they sing "Bring Out Your Dead," and um, I suppose it's the Holy Grail movie, but with uh, with, with music instead. <laughs> we'll take that song now. Oh eight four five three zero three double three. 
Story is our number. Were you here last night? Did you see it or you've got tickets to see it? You can talk to the three stars today. Uh, we're here at the uh, Grand Theatre in Leeds celebrating the music of Spamalot. We've got Marcus Brigstock, Todd Carty and of course Hayley to Madden as well who is the um, bit of totty in this really. And you're, you're so lucky because normally in West End shows it's full of like gorgeous girls and all that. You've really not got much competition. There's you and about two others and you get to steal the show. I know, it's great isn't it? Get to wear uh, lots of lovely costumes, all sparkly, loads of makeup and I get to snog Marcus. What mm. more could a girl want? When you applied to be in this business, did you ever think it would come to this? No. I, what, snogging Marcus Brickstone? <laughs> <laughs> Never in a million years. A lot of people go into showbiz hoping that that will be the end game of, of what they're <laughs> achieving, you know, a lot. When we, when we first started rehearsals, I was, I was slightly nervous. A, he's like a million foot tall and I'm like tiny um, so I had to like pull his shoulders down to do that little bit and um, we, we then got a note didn't we halfway through um, we'd just opened I think after week one and the, the director said this kiss is not doing it for me I was like, what should we do? And he went, I think you need to make it bigger, make it more. And I was like, oh, no, it's going to be one of those awkward moments where we've got to now go and practice this. <laughs> but it's um, it's been OK, hasn't it? We've done yeah, it's right. fine. I mean, it, it, that's the thing with something like that. It's quite weird on stage. And after we got that note, I, on one occasion, I actually swallowed her whole head. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still on a list somewhere, or has that been... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Todd Carty, let's come to you and talk about your life and career, because the thing we all know you for is Grain Chill, which some people may have forgot, but, of course, EastEnders yeah. is the thing that everybody loves you for. Um, do you mind that? Because I know a lot of soap people end up resenting what makes them famous. No, I, I like it when people... I mean, they, they sort of nickname me Tucker and TC on this uh, role, and, <laughs> in fact, um, Mark um, Graham, who plays um, um, the Knights of Knees, used a few Tucker gags, and even when he was covering for Mark, Marcus, Marcus doesn't know this, but they shout, shout out flipping it Tucker while he was halfway through the song. <laughs> so that I don't mind because, you know, sometimes your school days are the best or the worst days of your life. In my, my case, because I've been a child actor since I was four, they were the happiest days of my life. So I like it when people shout out Tucker, you know, particularly burly bu builders or Tucker <laughs> or cab drivers or the, they talk about skating. They talk about it's a generational thing, I think. So I, I don't mind. It's got me, it's made me the man I am today. So what can I do about it? You were a child star, but you're not in rehab every five minutes. What do you think's gone wrong between your day and today? I think um, the rehab was uh, full at the time I applied to go for one of the kids, so uh, I don't know, I just had good, good family, good friends, you know, keep me, keep me down to earth, that's all. And of course lately we know you from the, the dancing and the dancing on ice, and uh, that didn't go so well for you, did it really? Well, I think that was my career in the ice skating over in week three or four, but I, I held on, there's something about the great British public, they like to, you know... I laugh think at people. they like to laugh at people. They, they like to take a half wit to their hearts. We like a failure. Yes, we like a failure. <laughs> so I failed gloriously, but uh, at least I went out in uh, blazing colours. But again, great fun. My kids were there that night and they thought they'd never see their daddy again. So thank God for the backstage crew who picked me up off my backside. And I can't swear on this. <laughs> Can um, we ask you about that scene specifically? Because it was so brilliantly awful. It must have been rehearsed, was it? Well, I was supposed to go in that um, direction, but not in quite such a sophisticated manner. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job at and you kind of laugh at yourself and I think that's why people like you you don't tend to take yourself too seriously is that important? Um, yeah I think so I think you just get up in the morning and if you can uh, survive t t towards the end of the day then that's half the battle and what about you in this play? When they said, do you want to play this guy who looks gormless on stage for two and a half hours? You said yes. Well, why? I jumped at the chance. Again, typecasting. But um, not the real reason was I get to sing the iconic song, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. So um, when they offered it to me, I, I, I bit the producer's hand off and spat his fingers out and said, thank you very much. And here we are six or seven weeks down, down the line. But it's been great fun, great cast, lovely company. And um, I couldn't ask for more. Say no more. We're going to end with that because that's obviously the big song. When I heard you sing last night with those thousands or so people here at the Grand. It just reminded me of Andrea Bocelli, Russell Watson. I mean, you really have a beautiful voice, don't you? Listen, Placido Domingo, I ain't. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't need to have a great singing voice. I'll leave that to, leave that to Hayley. She's the, she's the nightingale. Right. <laughs> we'll play some of that in a little bit. First, though, I think we need a bit of camp old nonsense. You want some Donna Summer? Please. I love Donna Summer with all of my heart. <laughs> I never thought we'd hear you say that. Marcus Brigstock and the stars of Spamalot here today. And, of course, Hayley to Madden is best known for Emmerdale, which is in our patch. Congratulations. Hey! 
yes. And I live in Leeds, hooray. Is this best, I mean, just to come home to your own theatre when everybody knows you and can bring your own family in and stuff, is that cool? It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, I have actually never played the Leeds Grand, so to be here, and this is where I live, and, you know, I know everyone here. It's so nice. And I've had, like, all my family came last night, and I think all the Emmerdale bunch are coming at some point this week, which would be really good. So, yeah, it's brilliant. Nice You're to be here. You're going to show us your dingles. <laughs> oh, you just couldn't resist, Marcus, could you? I would have done it, but I was banned from saying it, so at least you got away with it. Um, when they're in, though, does that add an extra pressure and make you a little bit more nervous, or do you just ignore them? Oh, no, it really puts pressure on. Because you always feel like, like last night with my family there, you know, it's not often my dad actually gets to come to the theatre to see me. And um, he said to me last night, when we do this little section, me and Marcus, and he said, I was so shocked to see what you were doing on the stage. I was like, oh, my God, Dad, I'm sorry. But, um, no, I, I, I do get nervous, yeah. Yeah, obviously. And you do look delicious in this, let's face it, and it's a very sexy dress you're wearing. No, no, Marcus, come on, please. Um, when your dad looks at you like that, what's he actually just observing your voice and, and, and ignoring the rest? Because it's a flirty role, isn't it? It is a flirty role. Um, he said that, that, that this is the best he's ever heard me sing, which is lovely. You know, he's seen kind of every show I've ever done. Um, but he did say there is a moment in the show where I'm quite saucy um, behind Marcus's back. and he... I, I still don't know what she does. I genuinely... <laughs> I really don't, because I'm looking out front. I've no idea what any of them are doing. And um, that's the one bit my dad happened to remember out of the whole show is the bit I was doing behind Marcus's back. And he said, well, I was so shocked to see. I said to your mother, I can't believe it, Carol. Look at what she's doing. <laughs> and you've got big belters, haven't you? Have I? <laughs> <laughs> yes, big belting numbers, yes. And it's hard work. It's not easy. Um, and, you know... Marcus drags us out on the night time and it is your fault that we oh, well. pretty much go out most nights and then the next day I come in and I'm like oh no I need to sing all these songs but it's good I love it I mean your body's obviously a temple Marcus what about the voice do you have to really you know do you gargle with glycerine every night and thing <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah yeah, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, um, singing is is very natural for me. I've had to help Haley a lot. Um, no, honestly, I you know I've done stand up in front of thousands of people, which I know for a lot of people would represent perhaps their biggest fear. I have never been more scared than I was. No, actually, funnily enough, not at the first performance, but in the rehearsal room, having to sing in front of the rest of the cast. And my the first time I tried to do it, my throat literally just went, "No, I'm sorry, we cannot help you today." I just like close over I've never felt anything like it it was like my body conspired against me but yeah I mean the singing's been a revelation to me it really has and having been genuinely like shaking with fear uh, I now really look forward to it I mean whether the cast or audience do is none of my business frankly but I like it I think your voice is as good as the set really um, we'll, we'll get back to that no 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 no. you're not that bad really? alright we're going to give you 40 quid on the set so that's I'm pretty happy with that it's all about the content we're going to come back next with Marcus Todd and also Hayley speaking to the stars of Spamalot we're live from the Grand Theatre today it's on all week it's called Spamalot it's very funny if you don't mind the old rude word you're going to love it and it's got more gags in it than any other show I've ever seen Can't insurance. Oh, hello, Ailey wants to say something. I'm buying a new car today, yay! What are you getting? Don't know yet, but I'm buying one. Digger. Decided. A digger. <laughs> it's got to be small, because I'm small. That's such a girly thing, though. You're going out to buy a car that you don't know what it is. No guy would ever do that. You'd go out knowing the car you want to buy, wouldn't you, Tom? Well, well I think it must be a boy-girl thing, yeah. I, um, I like it big and chunky. <laughs> <laughs> I like it small and petite, thank you very much. Lovely, and you? I like mine driven by Donna Summer. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, it's car insurance. Yeah. And has yours gone up this year, Mark? Uh, My car insurance? I've absolutely no idea. You're so rich, you don't even look, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't, not only do I not look, I pay someone to not look on my behalf. <laughs> I love showbiz people. What else have you got? Uh, well, uh, as well as car insurance, we are talking uh, about uh, the anniversary of Live Aid, 25th anniversary of Live Aid today. And uh, we're asking the question, you know, well, we're take, taking a look back. We'll play some tunes as well. We'll hear from one of the hosts who uh, hosted the show at Wembley Stadium. 25 years ago uh, and also we are asking you the question whether Live Aid actually did change the world um, did it make any difference at all um, we'll speak to a charity worker who uh, worked out in Mozambique he's been in Haiti this year and uh, to actually ask him where does the money go and has it actually made any difference at all uh, and we'll certainly look back to the 13th of July two th uh, not 2005 1985 1985 we'll be going back to it's interesting isn't it because there still seems to be a lot of people starving over there so it didn't do that much good did it really well maybe it did but maybe uh, circumstances 
circumstances have changed? To be honest, I can't answer that question. We'll speak to our aid worker after one o'clock. Uh, I'll see you at 12. Thank you, Shojo. I'll tell you what I did after the show yesterday, and you're not going to like this because I went and asked the punters what they thought, which must always make you nervous. Do you ever do that? Just hang around public toilets, Marcus, and just hear what the people are saying? Yes. Mm. Yes. Haley. Yeah, I've done that as well. Mm. Todd? Not this week. Not this week. Let's hear what the punters were saying last night then outside the Leeds Grand for the production Spam a lot. Yes, absolutely brilliant. What's the best bit so far? The night stamps in Camelot. Are, are you getting all the mucky jokes in the show? Absolutely not. Yeah. They go over my head, but he gets them all. Well, it's got some very classic songs in it, yes. My mum and dad had never let me watch it when I was young. There's some very basic humour. It's uh, easy for me, yes. Bottom humour in place. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. Right. What are you making of it? Are you keeping up with all the jokes? Um, yeah, because we've been listening to all the, um, the music uh, on the records beforehand, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. You can follow it. I think it's okay. It's nice as well. It's a younger crowd, isn't it? There are people who are alive in the theatre, which makes a change. <laughs> <laughs> and what ice cream are you having? It's just plain vanilla. Is it all right? Expensive, but nice. Lovely. Well, that's the theatre for you. Nice talk to you. isn't it? I've never been in one before. So. This is your first time? For this type of thing, yeah. You're enjoying it? Yes, I am. I, I I'm sort of came under sufferance because it's more his kind of thing. But, um, yeah, it's, it's very humorous. The jokes aren't too mucky for you, are they? Oh, no. No. Very sedate. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Really, really funny. I think Marcus Brigstock is absolutely fantastic and the lyrics are so funny and they're all just brilliant. There, there is raunchy humour, but it's uh, nicely placed and it's not too offensive. No, and it's all part of Monty Python anyway and that's what you expect, isn't it? It is very funny. I have really enjoyed it. How old are you? I'm 17. 17 years old. And you come with Mum? Yep, yeah, and Dad. Is it all right for him at 17? Yes, it's fine. Nothing he hasn't heard in the playground? Quite. <laughs> what are you making of it? Oh, it's great. Absolutely brilliant. Yes, yeah. Nice time. Hello, what's your name? Uh, Michael. Are you enjoying the show? Yeah, I am, actually. It's very good. You're getting all the jokes? Um, I'm getting some of them, but oh, yeah. Good. No, that's best. You only get some of them. Dad, what are you making of it? I'm um, fine. Very good. I particularly like Marcus Brigstock's comment about the uh, sound system and the lighting. I think it's wonderful. It's really really, really good. Are you a regular theatre goer? I'd like to go more. Would you? Why, why can't you then? It's a bit steep on occasions. Do you think? How much is it for a ticket to this tonight? It's so long ago, I can't remember, but it had to be 30-something, was it? If you want to get a job at the BBC, then you get free tickets, you see. That would be wonderful. Have you got any going? <laughs> well, enjoy the rest of your night. You better drink your wine. The bell's ring. Oh, gosh, yeah. See you in a bit. Thank, Thank you. you. Alex Belfield, in the morning. BBC Radio Leeds. The Lady of the Lake sings uh, Find Your Grail. Hayley Tamilden is uh, the lady who's playing it in Leeds. Did I get your name right this time? Absolutely well done. Well Why am done. I struggling with something that should be so simple? What have I been saying previously? Tamadin. Tamadin, but I like that. I think it makes you sound a bit foreign. I like well, that. Well, I am foreign, so Tamadin. Yeah. Good enough, right? I think we need to do that. It's a bit northern, Tamadin. Tamadin. Yeah, it's a bit down market. Tamadin sounds very, very pop. Really? Don't um, you think, Marcus? Tarmigan. Tarmigan? What? What? Tar- a type of bird. Um, Tarmac. Tarmac, OK. Yeah, I think we're doing fine. We've got so many nicknames in this show, honestly. T- uh, Tamagotchi. Tamagotchi. Uh, Tamiflu. <laughs> Toboggan. Uh, Toboggan, yeah. Loads. Well, good for you, and you deserve them, because this is a great show, and you get that big number we just played, which is, it's like the side of the Eiger, isn't it, climbing that every show, and you've got to hit it and hit it, and every single note, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's, of course, the point of Spamalot. We're here today at uh, the Leeds Grand. It's all parody. Every song is almost taking the mickey out of something else. Yeah, it's, um, for the Lady of the Lake, it starts off relatively soft, and every number builds and builds and builds, and when you, when I do Find My Grail... It's like the biggest song ever in the world that I think I've ever had to do. And I panic about it every night. And I think I look at Marcus and he sees the fear in my eyes <laughs> as I'm about to hit this massive note thinking, will it come out? Please come out. But, it, you know, it's so far so good. And my favourite bit for you is Whatever Happened to My Part, which oh. is the bit where you come on and basically say, I haven't been on for ages. Why haven't I got a part? Which, again, is an in-joke within the theatre. Do you think people get all these in-jokes? Because people like Eric Idle and, uh, you know, the producers, people, they love to stick their own clever jokes. In. I think with um, that song, the first line, it, it's it's great watching their reaction because it sounds like I'm just going to sing whatever happened to my... And the minute you say part, everybody goes oh, and starts <laughs> laughing. So it takes them a while, but I think it's brilliant. And it's, it's genius. The song is genius. Mm. And as for you and your voice, we were alluding to it earlier. I mean, it is just gorgeous, a bit like a bit of charcoal under a door or something. Oh. Um, but, but you've actually got better, haven't you? Yeah, much, much. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, singing's just 
well, it's not just about confidence, but that's a big uh, a big part of it. And certainly until this interview, my confidence was really building. Um, no, I, yeah, it, it is. Uh, you know, if you think you can't sing, it's possible that you genuinely can't. But the musical director and the musical arrangers have been amazing on this. I mean, they've really had to literally hold me by the hand and go, no, that way, that way, and just kind of, you know, bat it into shape. So, uh, yeah, but it's really, it's really exciting. I mean, I, uh, I, who knows how I will ever write stand-up again after this. <laughs> Perhaps I'll just write a musical or something. Well, it's interesting because you've got some big notes at the end and you hit them. I mean, they are there mm. and you give them quite a lot of welly. Oh, yeah. it, does that come easy? Uh, giving things welly, yes, absolutely. <laughs> a precision is is what um, I've realised very important. But, you know, kind of in terms of, you know, belting out an idea, uh, I mean, that's sort of what my stand-up is. You know, my stuff has always been about, you know, developing an opinion and then going, right, everybody shut up and listen to me. This is what the truth is. And that takes a, a sort of fake confidence, which is very similar to what I have to do here. So, you know, to an extent with the singing... Um, um, that's what I'm doing. But obviously, you know, people know, they know the difference. When you when you misfire a note, you can see the first couple of rows close one eye and go, <laughs> ah, I've never ah. done it, though. I've noticed such a change in Marcus. Like, in rehearsals, I mean, I missed the first four weeks, so I joined really late. And um, I remember thinking, God, he's quite nervous and quite... And, and there's such a change now. And I told him yesterday, actually, how dramatic his confidence change has been. I think you're doing amazingly well. Well, the, between that and the dancing that Todd and I have to do, uh, it's uh, we. Oh man, we struggled, didn't we? With the the choreographer and Todd and myself, nearly had a fist fight. Poor and old, she's a small uh, woman. Poor, poor old uh, what's her face? I can't remember. Jenny. Her name. Jenny, that's it. What's her face? This is show business. You can't call somebody what's her face. I think it's a good stage name. It's better than Jenny. Isn't it? Jenny's boring. <laughs> Jenny, Jenny. But um, no, she actually you could actually see the pain in her eyes when myself and Marcus walked into the. Uh, um, into the rehearsal room. I mean, literally. Oh, we hit the door. Mm. I mean, that's never a good sign, is it? With a choreographer, you know, in you come, boys, whack. <laughs> and as for the comedian community, I mean, they're all sneery and they take themselves very seriously. How have your compadres reacted to you being in a West End musical? Oh, don't tell them I'm in this. <laughs> oh, for God's sake, all my credibility will disappear completely. No, I, it's been it's been interesting. Um, very few of them have been to see it, which is you know fine. The one who have uh, they're all a bit sort of like yeah uh, yeah well done jealous I think that, that's the <laughs> word I'm jealous it for <laughs> you know it's, so it's sort of it, it's sort of weird really I mean I didn't expect many of my stand up mates to be massively enthusiastic about this um and that's fine, you know. I'm still doing stand-up and stuff. I'm going off and doing festivals at weekends in between shows, so uh, um, I can still put on my serious satire head when I do that. So this hasn't knocked the funny out of you, then? No, do you know what? <laughs> if, if anything, I feel uh, I feel funnier than I have for quite a while. I mean, my the comedy I've taken on for the last five years has been on very serious subjects and I especially after the last show I did which was all about theology and a crisis of faith um, I really wanted to do something light and silly and trivial and fun and, and this is that in spades frankly. But you're not going to be like Jason Manford whose whole act is now about having twins and babies it's not going to be like your next show is going to be about the inside of musical theatre well, it might be love. You never know. No, I don't. I don't think so. I, I, generally speaking, with my stand-up, I've avoided saying too much about my real life uh, and much more about the things that I really care about. And obviously, I care about what I'm doing at the moment. But you have to be careful, you know, with regard to what interests other people. You know, so uh, I don't know. I might. I might be like Jason and talk about his twins. I think so. I think that's the way forward. What's next for you, Todd? Because I know you're in this till Christmas and you're one of those people that everybody seems to want to see. You can almost find a role in everything. Is that the place you've always wanted to be? Well, you keep telling the people that give me the work. That'd be very nice. Yeah. Um, and I directed my first feature film last year called The Perfect Burger. It's a comedy horror and that should be out in Halloween, loosely based on Sweeney Todd. But instead of chucking children into pork pies, we chuck them into hamburgers instead. 
<laughs> Have you got a dark side that we've never seen? Yeah, very dark, but I try not to let yeah. everyone see it. Do you think all the mockery from Dancing on Ice has kind of sent you to a, a worse place? Well, I've just come out of the Priory, so um, <laughs> it's just nice to be on the mean streets of Leeds. All right, we're going to take a piece of music. We'll come back with our remaining moments, and we will play the song that everybody wants to hear before the end of the show. We're talking to Hayley Marcus and Todd today on BBC Radio Leeds, live from the Grand Theatre. Back next with our remaining moments with the cast of Spamalot. Earlier on in the programme, we were talking about segregation in our communities, particularly in Bradford. Uh, loads of you texting in about this. Uh, you cannot understand what it's like until you're on the receiving end of racism. We need to concentrate on our common ground, not differences, which uh, the media always does. Uh, thank you, Cal, for that. Regarding mixing, it doesn't happen. The Asian community, especially the Muslim community, will not integrate. Despite being born here, they still do not speak English. Multiculturalism is a myth, says Mark. Uh, at the beginning of the programme, we were talking about antisocial behaviour. So many of you kicking off about this one, and I don't blame you. A new report out today basically saying that uh, they want our teachers and anybody other than the police to worry about our kids. The parents aren't mentioned either. They want people in parks to be looking after the kids and, and tackle antisocial behaviour head on. I'm a single dad with 12 and 13-year-old lads. I brought them up to be brave and to behave as well. Uh, I never had a problem with them in the community at all. Uh, don't tar all use with the same brush. Some parents are to blame, but not all, says John. And uh, finally, from Danny in Bradford, uh, what we need to do is give them something to do. When I grew up, there were youth clubs and activity centres and after-school clubs which kept us busy and out of trouble. What do you think about that, Marcus Brigstock? Which element of that? How long have I got? Well, let's give you one minute to talk about, because this is what you're great at, you see. You had this brilliant BBC Three thing, didn't you, which has been axed, never mind. And uh, that's gone the way of your singing, hasn't it, really? Yes, it has. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but you're, you're very strong opinion. What do you think then? The police no longer are, are the forefront of our defence mechanism against Asbo kids. It's people like park rangers. Oh, I mean, the, the idea of a more integrated approach to, um, you know, providing a structure in society for children to, to live well and have somewhere to go and places to play and people to be accountable to is, in essence, a very strong one. But, you know, what the Conservatives proposed before the election um, didn't seem to be that. It seemed to be a sort of handing over of responsibility, you know, which in essence is good. Um, but in reality, I don't know whether people are really equipped to do that because they're not willing to deal with, um, with what's at the core of it. You know, and what I suspect may be at the core of it is uh, the fact that the insurance companies and the litigation um, companies have worked, conspired together with the help of government who've turned a blind eye to it so that most places that most people go, they feel they cannot do anything. And the media have bought into this boogeyman, the idea of the elf and safety inspector, who doesn't really exist. It's the insurance companies and the litigation companies. So people are scared to get involved or to, you know, do whatever it is they feel they need to do. And yes, you know, teenagers especially need to have places to go. But you know, people need to remember that part of being a teenager is choosing not to go to wherever those places are, youth clubs or whatever. It's choosing to hang out on a street corner in a park or whatever. And that's really important for them to do. You don't need to be terrified of those people unless they do something which is genuinely terrifying. See, that was the big question this morning. If you leave the theatre tonight and there's a group of 10 hoodies on the other side of the road painting graffiti all over the wall, would you step in? Uh, it depends entirely on the quality of the graffiti. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You know, a lot, of a lot of graffiti. Why should we accept... Banksy wrote a really interesting thing in his book. Why should we accept adverts all over the place for stuff that we don't want to buy, plastered everywhere? That's graffiti as well. If someone does something genuinely creative with a spray can, go ahead, knock yourself out. If all you can do is write a name that you've made Isn't up, he fabulous? Then you're a cretin. <laughs> oh, Marcus Brigstock. Listen, guys, we've got to go. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Well, to Marcus Brigstock. Such, I mean, I just think you're amazing, and uh, what a voice as well. King Arthur, Marcus Brigstock will be here in Spamalot. Todd Carty uh, plays Patsy, and uh, Hayley Tamadon as well is the Lady of the Lake. Finally, after 55 minutes, I've got it right. Brilliant. Thank you so much for talking to me today. It's lovely meeting you. Yeah, you too. Have a nice day. And Hayley, you're delicious. Thank you very much. So are you. Will you marry me? Yes. Marcus, I don't want to marry you, but thank you for being you. You're, you're a star. Let's go and do some graffiti. All right. <laughs> See you soon. Let's end with a song that everybody wants to hear. 